Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our multimodality imaging conference. Today, we'll be talking about mitral and aortic regurgitation evaluation by echo and CMR. My name is Nadine Faza, and I'll be talking about the echo evaluation of MR and AR. And Dr. Carlos Altilawi will be talking about CMR evaluation of uh, MR and AI. All right. As mentioned, I'll be talking about echo, but we'll also explain when you should use MRI for evaluation of these important regurgitant lesions. The approach to regurgitant lesions include first defining the mechanism, then determining the severity, incorporating multiple parameters, followed by evaluation of consequences of these lesions, and finally determining the timing and the management options. My talk will be based on the ASC guidelines for the evaluation of non-invasive evaluation of native valvular regurgitation. Starting with mitral regurgitation, as you all know, the mitral valve is a very mighty valve and is a very complex structure that relies on the interaction between different components, which include the papillary muscles, the cords, the anterior and posterior leaflet, and the mitral valve annulus, in addition to the LA and the LV. Any dysfunction in any of these components can lead to significant dysfunction and lead to mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation can be classified into primary or secondary. Primary mitral regurgitation can be due to leaflet perforation or cleft, mitral valve prolapse or flail, or rheumatic mitral valve disease, mitral annular calcification, or drug-induced MR. Secondary MR can be divided into atrial MR and functional MR, which can be either ischemic or due to non-ischemic or ischemic cardiomyopathies. It's important to remember that the mitral valve world is a 3D world. So when you're doing a transosophageal evaluation of the mitral valve, it's important to get an on fast surgical view that shows the different components of the valve and helps in localizing the pathology. This is a 3D view of the mitral valve, and your anterior, uh, your anterior aspect is bordered by the aortic valve. The anterior atrial septum forms the medial aspect. The left atrial appendage forms the lateral aspect. So this would be your anterior leaflet, and this would be your posterior leaflet. The scallops closest to the septum are the A3 and the P3 scallops, while the ones closest to the appendage are the A1 and the P1 scallops. 3D TE can be very helpful in localizing um, the, the pathology. So the first example is an example of a P2 flail, the second example of an A2 flail, and the last example is that of an A3 uh, flail. Again, sometimes it's obvious by 2D, but the addition of 3D imaging can be very helpful in localizing um, the lesions. Another time when 3D imaging can be very helpful is in mitral valve clefts. So a lot of times you see patients with MR that cannot be explained based on 2D imaging, and 3D imaging can be very helpful in unmasking such uh, mitral valve clefts. When you see mitral valve clefts, always think about endocardial cushion defects and look for primary ASDs. Going over some of the phenotypes of primary MR, this is a case of bileaflet mitral valve prolapse, and you always want to rely on your parasternal long axis view to determine if there's any significant uh, leaflet prolapse. This has resulted in late systolic MR, so you can appreciate that in early systole you don't have much MR, and then towards the end of systole is where you develop the regurgitation. So determining the timing can be very helpful. This is a TE example of a myxomatous mitral valve with a patient with Barlow's disease showing by leaflet prolapse and anteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. Other phenotypes of primary MR include fibroelastic deficiency, and this usually leads to a focal flail. So the leaflets are otherwise thin and not myxomatous. This is an example of a posterior leaflet flail leading to significant uh, mitral regurgitation. You can tell that the mitral regurgitation is eccentric and anteriorly directed. This patient um, underwent mitral clip uh, implantation as he was at a high surgical risk. The 3D image shows you um, the, P3, the P2 flail and then the patient underwent implantation of two mitral clips with significant reduction in mitral regurgitation. 
Other causes of primary MR include carcinoid heart disease, and this is characterized by endocardial plaques of fibrous tissue that affect the leaflets and the subvalvular apparatus. And you see the coaptation uh, defect between the two leaflets, and this can cause significant MR. While we see this more often in tricuspid regurgitation, it is seen um, in 10% of the time in left-sided disease in patients with liver meds, bronchial uh, lesions, or intracardiac um, uh, shunts. Another cause of primary MR includes radiation-induced mitral valve disease, which develops years after radiation. And in such patients, you have thickening of the aortic valve, thickening of the aortic mitral intervalvular fibrosum, and thickening of the mitral valve leaflets. Parachute mitral valve disease is a rare cause of MR, where both leaflets are usually attached to a single papillary muscle. Switching gears to functional MR, Functional MR can be divided into secondary MR um, as a result of ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. In these cases, you have LV dilation and dyskinesia with displacement of the papillary muscle and tethering of the leaflets. Um, so this usually occurs in patients with depressed EF. The treatment for uh, Functional uh, secondary mitral regurgitation include the guideline directed medical therapy and CRT, and if it remains severe, then tr transcatheter edge to edge repair can be considered. Atrial function, uh, functional mitral regurgitation occurs in patients who have preserved LVEF but who have um, atrial fibrillation or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and it's characterized by marked dilation in the LA leading to annular dilation. Um, in these patients, again, it's important to address um, the secondary causes of the atrial dilation and then uh, consider either surgery or mitral clip. Current studies are being done to determine the best uh, management strategy for these patients. This is an example of a severe functional MR secondary to LV dysfunction. And you notice the severe mitral annular dilation with the tenting and tethering of the leaflets and central coaptation gap leading to severe mitral regurgitation. And you can appreciate this posterior leaflet tethering by 3D imaging as well. Again, this patient um, was optimized uh, medically, continued to have severe mitral regurgitation, and underwent transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair with placement of three mitral clips and significant reduction in mitral regurgitation. Another cause of MR include papillary muscle rupture. And this is something you need to think about when patients present with, with chest pain and, and you hear a, a murmur. And this murmur can be soft as it's often because of acute MR. So as you can see in this uh, TE image, you have a rupture of the pap muscle leading to the flail of the anterior leaflet with significant um, MR. And the aterolateral papillary muscle has dual supply from the LED and the circ, while the posterior medial papillary muscle is supplied by the PDA and is therefore more likely to rupture. And the management is this case is surgery. So it's important to always auscultate patients presenting with, with chest pain. And this is um, a finding that you see in late presenting MIs, which we've seen a few of during the COVID pandemic. Switching gears and talking about quantification of MR. So as mentioned previously, the jet characterization and determining the timing of the jet is very important. This is an example of bileaflet prolapse where you don't see much um, MR by early or mid systole, but you can appreciate the MR in late systole. So always when describing your MI when you're reading an echo, make sure to mention the timing because that plays into the uh, significance of the lesion. Diastolic mitral regurgitation in, is when you have mitral regurgitation in diastole. You can see this by uh, the Doppler tracing right here. And this occurs when your LVEDP is more than the left atrial pressure. This phenomenon is seen in AV blocks and severe aortic regurgitation. Colored Doppler parameters can be very helpful in um, assessing MR severity. The, we look at the regurgitin jet area but multiple things can affect the regurgitin jet area. That's why it's important to incorporate multiple parameters when you're assessing MR severity. So factors affecting the jet area include the transvalvular pressure gradient, entrainment, and the Kawanda effect in, hug, in, um, in jets that hug the atrial wall. <laughs> 
Entrainment happens when uh, you have a high velocity jet and that leads to entrainment of blood cells making the jet appear larger than what it is. The Kawanda effect is when you have an uh, eccentric jet that appears to hug the atrial wall. When the fluid is attracted to a nearby surface, that causes friction and friction can slow down the velocity of the jet and reduce the size of the colored jet area. And if you just rely on color in these cases, you can underestimate MR severity. Vena contracta is the diameter of the narrowest part of the jet and is another parameter that, that we look at when we're evaluating mitral uh, regurgitation severity. The PISA method or the proximal isovelocity surface area is a helpful method when we're assessing mitral regurgitation severity and it uh, relies on us um, calculating the flow through the effective um, artifice area by looking at the proximal flow convergence area. So you start uh, by optimizing your Nyquist limit, and then when you drop the Nyquist limit between 30 and 40, then you have this hemispheric structure of the proximal convergent area. Calculating the regurgitant flow is done by multiplying the velocity, the aliasing velocity by the radius of the PISA, and that gives you your um, regurgitant flow. Then you will look at your CW through the mitral regurgitant jet, and if you divide the regurgitant flow by the peak velocity, that gives you your effective regurgitant orifice area. To get your regurgitant volume, you would multiply the effective regurgitant orifice area by the TVI of the regurgitant jet. So the proximal isovelocity surface area is a good method to quantify mitral regurgitation if the images are optimized and your Nyquist limit is, is set between 30 and 40. As you know, different methods have different limitations, and that's why I think one of the most important things to do when you're evaluating mitral regurgitation severity is to take into consideration multiple parameters. Limitations of PISA include the fact that it's not applicable when you have multiple jets, it's less reliable in, in eccentric jets, and it assumes a circular or hemispheric regurgitant orifice. Minor uh, you know, errors in measurements of the PISA radius can lead to substantial errors in the assessment of effective regurgitant orifice area. And your maximal PISA might not always coincide with the MRV max, especially if your mitral regurgitation is not holosystolic as we saw in cases of mitral valve prolapse. So these are some of the limitations of PISA and that's why it's important to incorporate different parameters when you're assessing MR severity. And this is a picture of Thunberg guidelines showing a 3D evaluation of the Threna contracta, and you can appreciate that there's a difference between primary and secondary um, uh, mitral regurgitation, where it's more circular, the vena contracta looks more circular in, in, uh, in primary MR versus more elliptical in secondary MR. Volumetric assessment can also be very um, helpful in evaluation of mitral valve, uh, mitral regurgitation severity. One of the methods is subtracting the stroke volume from the LVOT from the stroke volume or the flow through the mitral valve annulus. And the difference would be your mitral regurgitant volume. The limitations of this method is, is that it's not valid in combined mitral regurgitation and aortic regurgitation. And you're making the assumption that the mitral valve annulus is circular. And again, small errors in each measurement can lead to substantial errors in MR assessment. Another way we can um, volumetrically assess mitral regurgitation is by subtracting the LVOT stroke volume that we get by putting the pulse wave Doppler in the LVOT and checking the flow there from the total stroke volume that you're able to obtain from the Simpsons bi biplane method. This is kind of similar to the um, MRI method of evaluating mitral regurgitation. The limitations of this method include foreshortening when you don't have good apical windows, and sometimes the need for contrast so you can get accurate volumetric assessment of the ventricle. I think one of the most important points I wanted to emphasize today is how important it is to integrate multiple parameters when you're evaluating mitral regurgitation. This is the algorithm from the guidelines, and um, it gives you specific criteria for mild MR and for uh, severe MR and everything in between. So specific criteria for mild MR include small narrow jets, the vena contracta of 0.3 centimeters or less, when the PISA radius is absent or less than 0.3 centimeters at an acquisite limit of 30 to 40, 
when you have a mitral A uh, wave dominant flow, when you have soft and incomplete jet by uh, continuous wave Doppler, and when you have normal LV and LA size. That's more for primary MR. Severe MR is usually specific criteria include the presence of a flail leaflet, vena contracta width of 0.7 centimeters or more, a Pisa radius of one at an acquisite limit of 30 to 40, central large jet that's more than 50% of the LA area. And when you have pulmonary vein systolic flow reversal and enlarged LV with normal function. Again, the enlarged LV um, is usually seen in a severe primary MR because when you have secondary MR, you by default have uh, enlarged and depressed um, EF. If you don't have four of these criteria, then you can resort to your volumetric assessment and evaluate the effective regurgitant orifice area, your regurgitant volume, and your regurgitant fraction. An EROA of 0.4 centimeters or more, a regurgitant volume of 60 cc's or more, or a regurgitant fraction of 50% or more, all um, support the diagnosis of severe MR. At the end, if you look at your echo and you're still unable to make that determination, if the parameters don't match or if the images are technically difficult or the mechanism is unclear, the next step would be getting further evaluation by either a TE or CMR. Another time we resort to TE or CMR assessment is where you have discrepancy between your echo findings and the clinical presentation. The consequences of um, MR include LA enlargement, LV enlargement, LV dysfunction, and pulmonary hypertension. So these are other things to look at when you're evaluating the severity of mitral regurgitation. So this is a um, young patient who presented to clinic with dyspnea, and you can um, tell by looking at his echo that he has um, severe LV dilation, he has moderately depressed EF. You can appreciate that flail posterior leaflet, the patient had severe LA dilation, and uh, P pressures of 55. So those all tell us that this is likely to be a significant lesion because you're seeing the consequences of a significant lesion. LA dilation, LV dilation, pulmonary um, hypertension, and depressed EF. The primary uh, management of primary MR as specified by the 2020 ACCHA guidelines for, for any valve disease when you have severe symptomatic patients, that's usually a class one indication uh, to intervene. When you have asymptomatic patients with severe MR, then you have to look closely at your echo to determine if um, there's another indication for intervention. And that includes a left ventricular ejection fraction of 60% or less, left ventricular end systolic dimension of 40 millimeters or more, or a progressive increase in LV size or decrease in LV um, EF in three, uh, in three studies. So again, when you're looking at serial echocardiographic studies, these are things that you want to watch for because that can definitely be uh, part of the management plan. Management of secondary MR starts with um, guideline-directed medical therapy supervised by heart failure specialists, and I can't emphasize that enough. For patients who are optimized and un undergo CRT, then you reevaluate the mitral regurgitation and determine um, if the AF is more than 50%, so that goes with our atrial MR, uh, mitral valve surgery has a 2B recommendation, and now we have studies uh, looking at atrial um, mitral regurgitation for transcat transcatheter therapies. When the AF is less than 30% and the patient continues to have severe MR with symptoms despite optimal medical therapy, then transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair can be considered when you have favorable mitral valve anatomy an EF between 20 and 50%, an LV and systolic dimensions of 70 millimeters or less, and a PA a systolic pressure of 70 um, or less. And this is really based, the parameters are based on the results of two trials, the MITRA-FR and the COAP trials, that showed that transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair can have good and positive outcomes um, in, if treated, if patients are treated um, and have specific anatomical um, features related to their mitral valves and their um, LV function and size. So these two different trials looked at transcatheter edge to edge repair in functional MR patients, but they had different patient populations and had different outcomes. What we learned from these trials is that uh, patients with bigger LVs and less severe MR do worse than patients with smaller LVs and more severe MRs. So in the COAP trial, patients had lower LV and diastolic volumes, and they had higher um, 
effective regurgitant orifice areas, and they actually benefited from transcatheter edge to edge repair. And these are all parameters that you should report when you're looking at um, an ECHO4 MR. So I talked about ECHO4 uh, evaluation of MR, and when do we use CMR? So you use CMR when you have multiple jets, when you have eccentric jets that are challenging to evaluate by ECHO, again, when you have a discrepancy with clinical findings, for quantification of cardiac size and function, especially for serial follow-up, evaluation of LV scar at his, as it has prognostic implications, and in cases when you have multivalvular valve disease. A few words about aortic regurgitation. We always end up talking about mitral regurgitation more than AI. Um, showing you a case of a 31-year-old uh, female who presented to clinic with dyspnea on exertion. This is her parasternal lung axis view, and you can appreciate that there's LV dilation, uh, LV systolic dysfunction. You can see that there's an eccentric AI jet that we are not really seeing very clearly. And you look, if you look at the mitral valve, it looks like it's closing prematurely. So it gives you that... Uh, um, the sensation that there might be some element of mitral stenosis, but the leaflets look pretty um, thin. If you look at the M mode, you can appreciate this premature closure of your mitral valve where the valve is closing before your QRS complex. So this patient actually had a unicuspid aortic valve. You can uh, see that by the short axis views with a regurgitant jet. And if you look at the continuous wave Doppler of the AI jet, you can see that the density is equal to the density of the um, aortic valve forward flow. And you have a steep acceleration, uh, deceleration time, and that all points towards significant AI. Mechanism of AI either include um, aortic dilation or cusp perforation, cusp prolapse, or cusp restriction. So these are kind of the main mechanisms that lead to aortic regurgitation. Again, color Doppler can be very helpful in evaluation of AI severity. We look at the uh, jet width in relation to the LVOT. We look at the vena contracta, which is the narrowest um, diameter of the jet, and the jet area. M mode can be very helpful. Again, you're able to appreciate the early premature closure of the mitral valve before the QRS complex. And, um, Aortic regurgitation, you can also see fluttering of the anterior uh, mitral valve leaflet, but fluttering itself is not specific for severe AI. It's the premature closure that's specific for significant AI. But M mode can be very helpful in patients with AI. Volumetric assessment similar to MR can add additional information when you're trying to evaluate AI severity. So the PISA method can still be used in AI if you're able to appreciate this area of proximal flow convergence in the aorta. And you can also use the stroke, um, subtract the um, stroke volume from the mitral valve from the stroke vo volume from the LVOT and get your regurgitant volume. So again, you're looking at different parameters, including color Doppler, volumetric assessment, look for consequences of, of AI. Pulse wave and color uh, continuous wave Doppler are also very helpful in evaluating AI severity. You want to look at the jet density and compare it to the forward flow through the aortic valve, the deceleration rate, and the presence of any holodiastolic flow reversal in the proximal descending aorta. If you have a dense jet and if you have a steep deceleration rate and you have holodiastolic flow in the proximal descending aorta, these all um, suggest significant aortic regurgitation. In terms of um, evaluation of AI by echo, so the specific criteria for mild, mild AR include a vena contractor width of, point, uh, of less than 0.3 centimeters, a jet width of less than 25% of the LVOT, a small PISA, or if you're not able to see a PISA, soft or incomplete jet by continuous wave Doppler, a pressure half time of more than 500 milliseconds, and normal LV size. Specific criteria for severe AI include a flail leaflet, a vena contractor width of more than 0.6 centimeters, a central jet, or a jet width that occupies more than 65% of the LVOT area, large flow convergence, a pressure half time of less than 200 milliseconds, holodiastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta, or an enlarged LV.
if you have four of these criteria, this is specific for AI. But if not, you can rely on your volumetric assessment. So if you have a regurgitant volume of 60 cc's or more, a regurgitant fraction of 50% or more, or an effective regurgitant orifice area of 0.3 centimeters or more, then you have a diagnosis of severe AI. Again, when the mechanism is unclear, or if you're not sure what the quantification is, if there's a, any discrepancy with the clinical findings, um, then TE or CMR imaging can be very helpful. Again, when do you use MRI in aortic regurgitation cases? To identify the mechanism of aortic regurgitation in some cases, to quantify severity, to evaluate LV remodeling, and to screen for potential associ associated aortopathies, and when you have multivalvular disease, I want to quantify the different uh, valve lesions. MRI can be very useful. Management of um, AI by the guidelines. So again, any, any patient with severe symptomatic aortic regurgitation has a class one indication for an intervention. In asymptomatic patients, things that you want to look at when you're leading a study include an EF of 55% or less, an end systolic dimension of more than 50 millimeters, an end diastolic diameter of more than 65 millimeters, or if you have a progressive decrease in EF or increase in LV and diastolic dimensions in three studies. So I think the take home points from my uh, talk are it's important to define the mechanism of a regurgitant lesion, then determine the severity, evaluate for the consequences, and then always consider TE and MRI when the mechanism or severity are indeterminate or when there's a discrepancy with the clinical findings. Thank you so much. Turn it to Dr. Carlos Al-Tilawi so he can talk to us about MRI assessment of AI and MR. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Carlos Al-Tilawi. I'm uh, uh, just joined the Houston Methodist Cardiology Group. I'm going to talk today about uh, evaluation of mitral and aortic regurgitation by CMR. Before I begin, uh, just a reminder that you can uh, send us your questions either online or via text. Online, you can go to polev.com -E and then enter the Bakey. And then, um, or you can text the Bakey on 37607 and also send us your text there. I see some people also are over Zoom, and then we can see the screen, so you can also chat your text, your uh, questions over there, and then we can uh, we can address them at the end. Uh, this uh, this uh, uh, presentation has usually been historically given by Dr. Deepin Shah, so I, I will thank him for handing me the torch and providing me with some of the material for this talk. For this talk, the outline will be as following. First, we're going to talk about the CMR indications. Uh, I'm going to talk about my regurgitation, how we quantify the lesion, meaning the volume, the mechanism, the consequences of the, of the lesion. Um, we're going to uh, show some studies comparing MRI and echo, uh, repeat the same for aortic regurgitation, and then we'll a final slide about CMR strengths and limitations. So uh, starting with when is CMR indicated, Dr. Faza already touched upon these, um, these points, and this applies for really any type of regurgitation, whether it's mitral or aortic. So whenever you have suboptimal echo images and you suspect a significant lesion, MRI would be indicated. If you have discordance between 2D and Doppler echo, meaning you have left ventricular enlargement, for example, but it's not, um, there's discrepancy with the Doppler measures like color and, and then uh, pulse wave or, or continuous wave Doppler, this is another indication. Or if you have discordance between clinical assessment and echo severity, someone who's uh, short of breath, for example, and then you have a lesion on echo that it's not showing as significant. Can, MRI can, can be a tiebreaker in these situations. And obviously, when you have multiple valvular lesions, because MRI is a volumetric method for the most part, it can be also helpful to, uh, to assess um, when, when we have uh, two lesions. So how do we evaluate uh, the uh, volume of regurgitation? Uh, first of all, for the grading, and this applies also to aortic regurgitation, a mild is when regurgitant volume is less than 30 and fraction less than 30%. Moderate when we have 30 to 59 milliliters and then 30 to 49% fraction. And then severe is when we cross regurgitant volume of 60 and regurgitant fraction of 50%. Now, there are certain cases where there might not be concordance between regurgitant volume and fraction. This so mostly in, for example, primary MR due to flail, you will reach the threshold of volume before reaching, you might reach the threshold of volume before reaching that of the fraction because you have a large 
uh, LV stroke volume that's in the denominator of the fraction calculation. So you might still have a less than 50% fraction, but more than 60 milliliters volume. The opposite happens in secondary MR. Because of the low stroke volume, you might have a regurgent volume that's less than 60 milliliters, but fraction that is more than 50%. So in general, we put more weight for volume in the primary MR and more weight for fraction in secondary MR. Uh, there is now concordance between the ACCAHA guidelines of, of regurgitation and the ASE guidelines, uh, and this, uh, the, regurg the cutoff values that I, I showed earlier. So what are the methods by, by which we quantify mitral regurgitation um, uh, on MRI? So first of all, we have, this is the most robust and the workhorse really of the quantification is uh, by uh, subtracting the aortic stroke volume from the left ventricular stroke volume and this applies even in the presence of aortic regurgitation remember the AR volume whatever it is is part of both the LV stroke volume and the aortic stroke volume so when you subtract the two it will be cancelled out so this is more practical more studied more reproducible than other methods the other possibility if if the aortic stroke volume cannot be accurately quantified for whatever reason uh, those being for example turbulence in the LVOT due to SAM or because of aortic stenosis we can use the net pulmonic stroke volume volume and subtract that from the left ventricular stroke volume uh, and then uh, get the get the mitral regurgitation assuming there is, there is no intracardiac shunt. Another uh, method uh, that also can be employed is the uh, subtracting the right ventricular stroke volume from the left ventricular stroke volume. Obviously if you have MR the LV stroke volume would be higher than the RV stroke volume and then that difference should be MR only if you don't have other regurgitant lesions. So you, we have to uh, 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 you know, understand the caveats of each method before using it. Uh, finally, uh, we also can quantify, and we do quantify every time the regurgitant fraction, which is by definition the mitral regurgitant volume over left ventricular stroke volume. However, the purest definition of any regurgitant fraction is really the volume that crosses the valve in one direction and the opposite direction divided by the volume that crosses in the forward direction. So, in general, we use the left ventricular stroke volume as a representation of the volume that crosses the mitral valve in the forward direction. However, if we have aortic regurgitation, <coughs> that has to be subtracted from the left ventricular stroke volume so that we can only capture the volume that's crossing the mitral valve. And this is how we calculate regurgitant fraction. Now, how do we measure left ventricular stroke volume? We take multiple slices from the base to the apex, as you can see, of the ventricle. And then we, we draw uh, the volume, as you can see, for, for each slice. And then you, we use the, um, assuming each slice is a, is a disc, uh, um, uh, as a cylinder, we can calculate the volume by uh, multiplying the thickness, which is known by the slices, times the area, which is we, we calculate when we seed into the ventricle, as you can see in pink over here. Uh, <clears throat> how do we measure the forward flow? This is uh, done using phase contrast MRI. So in this example here, you can see an area region of interest around the aortic valve. And then uh, this will be tracked throughout systole and diastole. And then you can see the flow in green, uh, in this case, giving us uh, 90 uh, milliliters. And then so the regurgitant volume would be the subtraction of these two. And the regurgitant fraction would be um, the regurgitant volume over stroke volume. And then we get 38%. <coughs> In this case, the same thing we can do for the pulmonic stroke vo volume calculation. Again, we place a, a plane uh, of phase contrast uh, across the pulmonic, um, uh, pulmonic outflow, and then we calculate similarly the pulmonic stroke volume, and then we can subtract these two. So usually these are the methods, the volumetric methods by which we calculate AMRA. Another method that's uh, some labs use, we don't use, is direct planimetry of the anatomic regurgitant orifice area, not effective regurgitant orifice area. Obviously, effective uh, regurgitant orifice area is purely an echo calculation. We cannot calculate it uh, by MRI. Uh, so, and this is usually, the AROA is usually bigger uh, by area. So <clears throat> in one of the studies, a AROA more than 0 0.4 centimeters squared had a very high sensitivity and specificity compared to uh, and geographic grade of MR of three or four.
again we don't use it in this lab here but it, it, it has been used and it is used in other labs as a secondary methods <coughs> so after we um, finish uh, quantifying the lesion next we have to specify the mechanism of the lesion this is a slide from the um, ASE guidelines showing the list of all the possible mechanisms of um, uh, mitre regurgitation so they are usually divided into primary the most representative being mitre valve prolapse and flail but other uh, examples could be calcification, thickening, endocarditis, rheumatic. Uh, also, we have the congenital uh, cases. And then in secondary, usually it's secondary because of remodeling in the ventricle or remodeling in the atrium. Um, and I would show examples of these. Uh, so first of all, for primary, uh, it's a spectrum, obviously, primary, going from uh, fibroelastic deficiency all, all the way to Barlow's disease. Barlow's disease is usually the more uh, extensive form. It's usually uh, due to myxomatous degeneration. It's usually in younger age. It involves uh, multiple scallops of the sorry, multiple scallops of the um, of the mitral valve. And uh, uh, they usually the the, uh, the treatment approach is uh, is usually different between these two. Um, the f as for the localization of this, so now let's say we know that there is prolapse or there is flail, uh, we have to localize which segment of the mitral valve is involved. In this example here, we can take a short axis view at the almost the annulus of the mitral valve. At least you can see it during the annular descent. And this is kind of a more straightforward case where you see that the P2 leaflet here in this case. Uh, is the one responsible for the for the regurgitation sometimes you can have cases that are less straightforward and then the way uh, we approach those is to by acquiring um, slices uh, uh, throughout the entire annulus going from anterior all the way to posterior and then we compare where we see the jet most in each and in this case for example you can see that at the a3 p3 which is on the green here you see the jet and it's posteriorly directed showing us that there is an a3 scallop uh, flail and now there was comparative studies comparing the accuracy of CMR to compare to TEE for MR mechanism and in this particular study the gold standard was surgery so these were patients who were indicated for surgery the accuracy was pretty high uh, compared to TEE usually 90% or more uh, however the only uh, thing that CMR fails compared to TEE is to show a torn cord and this is inherent to MRI because MRI is a uh, multi-beat uh, acquisition so it is acquired over let's say 8 to 10 beats each image or each um, clip and therefore anything that has irregular motion will not be captured and shown in this final uh, final clip and cordy is one such example another such example for example are vegetations uh, so this is where it fails compared to the at showing um, uh, cord uh, ruptured cord uh, this is another example of primary MR this is a cal calcified mitral valve you see calcified annulus uh, calcified thick leaflets on MRI calcifications as opposed to CT and echo where calcifications are bright on MRI they look dark because calci calcium does not emit a signal so and uh, so we inherit we uh, we assume that this is calcium obviously based on the on the morphology and then here this is such a case of um, calcific mitre regurgitation when the valve is calcified the coaptation is not as smooth the coaptation zone and then you will have areas or, of mal coaptation on on both leaflets leading to uh, regurgitation Another example that is nicely shown here on MRI is rheumatic mitral valve. Uh, you can see nicely the hockey stick appearing in the appearance in diastole of the anterior leaflet, and then you can see the mitral regurgitation during systole. This is uh, moving on to secondary MR. This is a case of an ischemic, extreme case, I would say, of ischemic uh, secondary mitral regurgitation. And then you can you can see how on cine how the whole entire basal and mid inferior wall, uh, posterior wall is uh, almost aneurysmal. And then you have transmural scar in that area. This leads to tethering of the posterior leaflet. As you can see, the posterior leaflet is tethered, is not moving. It's like vertical throughout systole and diastole. And the anterior leaflet is trying to reach and co -op but it ends up co-opting to the side of the posterior leaflet, leading to this sometimes called relative prolapse of the anterior leaflet. It's not true prolapse. And then you have this posteriorly directed jet. 
Uh, Non-ischemic also can cause mitral regurgitation, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. This is also because of the enlarged ventricle tethering of the leaflets um, by the papillary muscles, <coughs> enlarged dilated annulus, so the leaflets cannot optimally coapt, and then you can have um, the, this uh, regurgitation. Another form of secondary MR that's more and more realized and studied nowadays is atrial MR. In this case, the ventricle really function is normal. The ventricle size is usually normal uh, or can be enlarged maybe because of the mitral regurgitation. And there's no scar or anything from below the, the mitral valve to, to, to lead to the regurgitation. Usually it's because of atrial enlargement leading to annular dilatation. And usually it's a two mechanism thing. The atrial the atrium enlarges and leads to annular dilatation. And also, these patients are usually in AFib, <coughs> in AFib so they lose the atrial kick. The atrial kick is important for the initial part of coaptation of the mitral valve before systole begins. So it kind of primes the valve for coaptation in systole. So that, if this is also lost, uh, mitral regurgitation can ensue. Uh, and uh, on this study in Jack Imaging recently, um, they showed how its um, atrial MR was more associated with uh, hyper people who have hypertension, atrial fibrillation, uh, they have uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and then echoes showed um, that although the LV systolic function is normal or EF is normal, actually the uh, diastolic function is pretty abnormal. And then when compared for outcomes against uh, primary MR, these patients do worse because, again, they have MR, but it's usually secondary to many other risk factors or many other pathologies, so they have a combined combined syndrome leading to worse outcomes. This is another example of mitral regurgitation, which is the mitral valve systol systolic anterior motion. You can see nicely on the paratronal long view the uh, movement of the anterior leaflet towards the septum and systole. And then on the short axis also, I, sh I showed this just because I thought it's interesting. You see the anterior leaflet, how it moves anteriorly and touches the septum uh, by the LVOT. Finally, for the examples, again, uh, this is a case that Dr. Faz also showed uh, on echo, uh, the cleft, a cleft, a case of cleft mitral valve leading to mitral regurgitation. Uh, again, if we do short axis views on MRI, uh, the analysis, you can, most of the, most of the times you can tell the, the mechanism, and this is, this is one such example. Um, a uh, final part of the mitral regurgitation assessment, obviously in the report we have to show the quantification again, the, the volume, we have to specify the mechanism, and then finally we have to say what did this MR do to the heart. So um, as I showed earlier, um, uh, MR, um, CMR can uh, accurately quantify volumes, uh, whether it's the left ventricle or the left atrium, and usually chronic severe MR is associated with enlargement of both these chambers. This is how we quantify again, uh, going from base to apex, how we quantify the ventricular volume. The left atrial volume is quantified using the biplane area length method. Uh, and uh, the, the cutoffs for severity are way different than echo, actually. So the upper normal of indexed left atrial volume on MRI is 52 milliliters per meter squared. 52 to 63 is mild, 63 to 73 is moderate. And then we call severe whenever the left atrial index volume is more than 73. Uh, besides the volume effect of the of the MR, uh, we uh, recently in the, in the past years there was realization that specifically mitral valve prolapse uh, can cause a scar, a non-CAD scar in the ventricle in the in the posterior wall. Uh, and um, studies from this institution have specifically uh, characterized the location and the extent of the scar, and being specific to the mitral valve prolapse as opposed to other types of primary MR and being associated more with, um, uh, with really prolapse as opposed to a degrade of the regurgitation. Um, and historically, as we know, that mitral valve prolapse has been associated with arrhythmias, with symptoms of palpitations. Uh, and uh, really now MRI bridges these, uh, these observations by um, you know, showing that how mitral valve prolapse can cause um, scar in the, in, the, in the posterior wall usually of the, of the ventricle. The theory is that there is mechanical stretch from the cords and papillary muscles 
on that area and then that stretch with time leads to mechano mechanobiological changes in the papillary muscles and in the wall leading to eventual formation of scar. Now, how does CMR compared against ECHO for mitral regurgitation grading? So I'm gonna show a, a couple of studies. This one has compared uh, MRI to ECHO uh, by taking patients who were undergoing surgery for mitral, or taking patient, uh, patients with mitral regurgitation and then the subset that were undergoing surgery. And then they used the left ventricular remodeling pre and post surgery as the standard, gold standard to compare to the mitral regurgitation, the associated with mitral regurgitation. So if you look at the uh, MRI regurgitant volume, it was much strongly associated with the extent of remodeling of the left ventricle as opposed to the echo-derived uh, regurgitant volume. Another study also, uh, in this particular one, the patients actually had a transthoracic echo, a transesophageal echo, and a cardiac MRI within 24 hours. And then the, there was a combination of the echo, transthoracic echo, and TEE together to get a calculation of the uh, mitral regurgitant volume. And then that was compared for discordance uh, and then for outcomes with MRI. There was concordant grading of severity in almost three quarters of the patient. And then the other quarters where there was discordance, the, uh, the uh, culprits for this discordance usually were uh, late systolic jets, multiple jets, or eccentric jets. As we know, usually mitral regurgitation is uh, quantified on echo by PISA, this is usually the first line method, and then we know that PISA fails sometimes in, in any of these three um, uh, characteristics. In this same study, when they compared the MRI regression volume to the echo regression volume for outcomes, in this case, all-cause mortality and indication for surgery, in red is the curves for uh, MRI, severe, uh, severe MR on MRI, and in, in black is um, moderate or severe on echo. You can see that the separation is by color, meaning the MRI quantification of severe was uh, associated with worse outcomes compared to the echo, whether it was moderate or severe, meaning that the MRI quantification was more uh, robust uh, with outcomes when compared to outcomes as, as the um, gold standard. One last mention, this is, this is not echo against MRI, this is more MRI versus MRI. Uh, <clears throat> this is an observation and a study that we published here, specifically in patients who have Barlow's disease, and then we, we started looking at their prolapse volume, as you can see here, which is the volume beneath the leaflets, um, uh, between the annulus and the leaflets, and then we, we quantified in our study this prolapse volume, and then we were able to show how for the same transvalvular mitral regurgitation, adding prolapse volume leads to increase in the ventricular size. So meaning that this prolapse volume, at least in this um, cross-sectional study, uh, should be probably taken into account. We are undergoing more prospective study to confirm this. <coughs> Next, we're gonna talk uh, about aortic regurgitation. Again, the grading is similar by volume to end fraction to mitral regurgitation, at least for now. Uh, how do we define severe MR? More than 60, more than 50%, and this is again by ACC and AIC guidelines. If MRI can provide uh, the mechanism for AR, similar to uh, MR, so we can see here, for example, case of quadricuspid aortic valve, bicuspid aortic valve, uh, a trileaflet aortic valve, and then even in cases that have a bioprosthetic aortic valve. Mechanical aortic valves, is, uh, we, we won't be able to see on MRI, so that will be more difficult. So how do we quantify the aortic regurgitant volume? Uh, usually, again, the first line method here is direct measurement of regurgitant flow, and I will show example of that. Indirect methods are uh, subtracting the net pulmonic stroke volume from the aortic stroke volume, net meaning by taking from it the pulmonic uh, regurgitation, or we can compare also the, or subtract the right ventricular stroke volume from the left ventricular stroke volume, again, in the absence of other regurgitant lesions or something. And regurgitant fraction is the flow in the opposite direction compared to the flow divided by the flow in the normal direction, in the forward direction.
This is how uh, we measure the uh, aortic regurgitation by the direct method. So we place a uh, phase contrast plane uh, at the, usually at the ST junction. And then you can see in this example the forward flow, in this case 118 milliliters, and then the aortic regurgitant flow uh, in diastole you see like it goes below the baseline. In this case it was 48 milliliters. This same case, uh, the pulmonic, uh, the pulmonic flow, net pulmonic flow was 73. So the indirect method gave 45. So we have 45 on the indirect, 48 on the on the direct method. So they're usually uh, within within the error, you know, limitations of uh, the errors of the measurements. Uh, but these are the examples of how we how we measure. Um, Another, uh, another, uh, not quantification, but like gives us an idea about severity on MRI is assessing the fl descending, the the uh, flow reversal in the descending thoracic aorta. So as you can see here, we place a phase contrast plane on the descending thoracic aorta, and then you can see this hollow diastolic flow reversal, indicating significant AR. And now this was studied actually uh, comp uh, compared to echo and then um, compared to uh, regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction by MRI. So uh, in this particular study, a lot of the patients who had, uh, so they defined actually severe AR as patients who have uh, reversal in the aorta and then there was a lot of uh, reclassification uh, of the echo uh, um, grade when this was used as a um, uh, kind of characteristic of severe severe AR. Um, and actually, in this also study, the reversal in the aorta was independently associated with heart failure, hospitalization, and cardiovascular death. Also, and this is, I think this is important, and this is a teaching point, that eccentric jets of AR on echo was more frequently seen in patients with uh, regurgitated, uh, reversal of aortic flow on CMR. Uh, so this is uh, similar to um, uh, mitre regurgitation, really, where eccentric jets can fool us, and same in aortic regurgitation, so we have to be really careful and the aortic regurgitation happens, is happening in a very confined space of the LVOT, so it can easily lose velocity, uh, and then you know color Doppler might not be really impressive. Uh, also interesting, interesting is that patients who have a reversal of flow in the aorta had the regurgitant fraction cutoff on average of 27 percent, which had the highest sensitivity and specificity for for the finding of reversal of flow. This is way less than the 50 percent that is uh, mentioned in the guidelines. Uh, and also other studies really using MRI showed very similar numbers ranging from 30 to 37 percent. Other associated findings that can be uh, identified by MRI also in addition to the regurgitation are obviously usually aortic regurgitation can occur in the case of congenitally malformed aortic valve, for example in this case a bicuspid valve, and then we can uh, measure the root, we can measure the aorta, we can check if there is uh, coarctation of the aorta. So these are all things that can be also complementary with MRI that we can, uh, we can see and um, um, you know, find and put in the report. Uh, last slide is about uh, the strengths and limitations. So again, MRI is very powerful modality. It has no limitations from uh, acoustic windows or body habitus with free cho choice of imaging planes. It has high signal to noise ratio. It says accurate and reproducible, and we can measure uh, viability in it. And then se severity assessment is purely based on volume and fraction. It's so independent of the shape or hemodynamic assumptions of the lesions. However, it has its own limitations. It's not widely available. Patients can be claustrophobic, cannot be performed at bedside, obviously like echo. Implantable, implanted devices and CKD are still issues. Or we, we, we become better with them, but they're still issues. Uh, the acquisition may require long breath holding. Arrhythmias can still be an issue. Again, small or irregularly mobile objects might not be well seen. Uh, phase contrast have low temper resolution compared to echo Doppler, so we need to, have, to be careful with estimating volumes and peak velocities. Uh, and then uh, finally, regurgitant volume and fractions cut off for severity. Uh, they don't have yet as much data as ACO, but this data is growing um, and then um, showing more and more strong associations with outcomes when, uh, might when uh, CMR is used for assessing regurgitation. And thank you so much. Again, uh, if you have uh, any questions, please. Uh, Enter the bakey on polev.com or text the bakey to 37607. I can't see any questions.
don't think anybody has something to discuss. Do we have any questions? Okay, I don't think, uh, it seems we don't have any questions. Uh, thank you so much for your attendance, and uh, we'll see you next.